Hello, everyone. I am so honored to be here today on behalf of Blue School and to have the opportunity, just to mix metaphors a little bit, to kick off this book launch for Imagine If, the extraordinary new work by Sir Ken and Kate Robinson. In the foreword of the book, Kate referred to her father's work and this book as a love letter to human potential, and it is. In many ways, I also look at Ken and Kate's work as a love letter to schools like ours that believe in the extraordinary possibility that each student brings with them each and every day, and that create the conditions where children become their most full, most capable, most incredible selves. Blue School was founded on the belief that it is not just that schools should nurture their students' curiosity, imagination, and creativity, but that they must, that it is a necessary imperative as we seek to create a better, more just, more inclusive, more peaceful, and more joyful world. And so it is now my great privilege to introduce to you Matt Goldman, one of the three original members of the Blue Man Group, who along with their partners founded Blue School and who is brilliant and caring and wise. And Kate Robinson, who wrote this amazing book that we are all here to talk about tonight and who I've had the tremendous pleasure of getting to know in anticipation of this event. Welcome and Matt and Kate. Thank you so much, Noah. Hi, Kate. <laughs> this is so wonderful, you know, uh, to give context for everyone, you know, through our work over the years with Ken uh, as an advisory board member of Blue School, um, uh, we met Kate as a, literally as a teenager. And um, Kate would babysit our toddler at the time so that Ken and Terry and Renee Rolari, our board chair, and I, when we visited Los Angeles, we could have productive meetings together. And um, it's been an absolute thrill and pleasure to watch Kate grow and evolve and, uh, and then eventually start to work with Ken, with her dad, to uh, grow and evolve his work. Um, and. Uh, but Kate is a incredible force on her own. She's a speaker and writer and uh, has been a part of initiatives uh, with her father, uh, the SKR Legacy Project and uh, Collective Fund and Imagine If. And she was, you're, you were the editor in chief of the educational organization, The Hundred. So, it is my incredible honor and pleasure to welcome you and uh, to spend the next hour with you. Thank, Thank you, you so Kate. much, so much, Matt. It's, it's incredible to be here. For those of you who maybe don't know, Dad launched a lot of his other books with Blue School, so it's very special to be doing this together with you. And also, I didn't realize how significant it was that I would babysit your son when you came for meetings until I had a toddler myself. <laughs> I realized actually you can't have anything productive when I just said I was coming to play. So it's, it's great. <laughs> it is great. And what, what was so fun about that is you were literally his first love at first sight. <laughs> it was you mutual. Hit it off so wonderfully. <laughs> so Kate, you know, today, as you know, <laughs> will be largely about uh, talking about the work of Ken and how you, together with you, uh, you documented uh, Ken's life work. Um, and we also wanna talk about how you plan to uh, grow and evolve and continue moving this important work forward into the future. Um, in an ideal world, uh, Ken would be here today on this Zoom uh, with, with both you and I. Um, we all miss Ken dearly. Uh, just so that we're, the audience is completely grounded in why we're here today and how we got here today, we are going to share this sh short video to celebrate the incomparable Sir Ken Robinson. Hello, I'm Sir Ken Robinson. There is a hunger 
um, four videos of me. <laughs> you know. Don't you feel? <laughs> so this whole event has been an elaborate build-up to me doing another one for you. So here it is. <laughs> See, in most respects, we're like the rest of life on Earth, aren't we? But in one respect, we're very different. We have powerful imaginations. Uh, all over the world, people are trying to figure out how to come to terms with the pandemic and what comes next. The question really is, what type of normal do we want to get back to? We've pressed pause on many of our social systems. It's time to press reset on them as well. children have deep personal talents and that was illustrated to me through my time in special education. It, it, throughout my adult life I've become more and more convinced that everybody has special needs, it doesn't matter what their circumstances are and that's a powerful case for making education more personalised and more individualised. There isn't an education system on the planet that teaches dance every day to children the way we teach them mathematics. Why? Why not? I think this is rather important. I think maths is very important, but so is dance. Children dance all the time, if they're allowed to. We all do. We all have bodies, don't we? You know, did I miss a meeting? I mean, I think... <laughs> Finding your element, to me, is essential to personal fulfilment because it's about discovering the truth within you, who you are, and what you're capable of, the things that make you feel at your most authentic. What we do know is, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. If you're not prepared to be wrong. And by the time they get to be adults, most kids have lost that capacity. Uh, they have become frightened of being wrong. never been to LA, you know, think it's all the movie business and nothing else, and plastic surgeons, you know, and we know that's not true, there are dentists here too. <laughs> <laughs> I and you are not lone voices here. Uh, the fact is there are conversations like you've been having the past few days happening all over the world, in, uh, in India, in uh, the rest of Asia, in Australia, well you know where the rest of the world is, don't you? Imagine the rest of the world, that's where it's all happening. You know, we are deeply creative creatures. We have boundless capacities for innovation, imagination and creativity. We have a common set of, of fortunes to confront and to create a new sort of world and a new kind of normal. There is an opportunity, it takes bravery and imagination and we have plenty of that in store. Wow, I never <laughs> get tired of hearing Ken's speak and his videos. And Kate, what I'm totally in awe of and struck by uh, when I watch Ken's work like this is his message of the incredible human potential that uh, in a way got us into a lot of the biggest world issues is exactly what we need to get us find solutions and answers uh, for solving and, and these issues. And, and, and the world is never in more of a need for those answers and the creativity and innovation of, of the, the, the human resource can provide. And uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions about the book before we start. Um, we're hoping to get have some time at the end to also have people in the audience uh, uh, ask questions. So if 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 questions uh, come across for you, please add them into the Q and A of the Zoom, and um, and and also put where you're from because that'll be fun. There's you know several thousand people on this Zoom and and we'll, we're from all over the world, and so. Uh, and then we'll 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 get to it at the end. Um, K, 
Kate, you decided, uh, you and your dad decided to call this a manifesto. Uh, manifesto means so many different things to so many different people. Um, can you give us a sense of how you were defining manifesto for yourselves and what was sort of giving you direction in, in, in this particular work? I can, of course. I think the first thing to say about it is that the idea for dad to have a manifesto um, came from dad, but it also came from somebody who's also not with us, who was dad's literary agent for 15 years, Peter Miller. Um, and together they came up with this idea of having a sort of short pocket sized book of dad's core beliefs and his values. Um, and the book, I only have the English edition with me at the minute, but the book that we have, you know, it, it is that kind of small thin book that you can wave in somebody's face, um, which, which I feel like is an important part of a manifesto. Um, when I was going through all of dad's notes, and so we, we worked together on the book shortly before he passed away, but when I was going through all of the notes in anticipation of embarking on this on my own, I came across a little piece of paper um, where he had written down, I have it here, where he had written down what a manifesto means to him. It's illegible, you can't read it at all, but I speak fluent, so can. Um, just about. So it's, it says, um, manifesto, a declaration of core values and beliefs, what I stand for. It, uh, I almost speak fluent, I can. It functions as a statement of principles and as a call to action. Um, and that's really what it, wanted, what it had to be. It had to be a distillation of, of his core beliefs, as well as what next, a real call to action, what what, what do we want people to do because of it? It couldn't just be, this is what he believes it had to be. And therefore this is what we do about it. Um, and I think, I hope, I hope that's, that's what we've managed to pack in. That's, that's, that's lovely. And but go ahead. Oh, could you elaborate on when you say core beliefs, what are, what are we, what are you referring to? Um, he had several, but I think, what it boiled down to was what Noah said in, in the introduction, you know, when I was going through all of the notes, I kind of went into it with my assumption of what dad's work was about. Um, and then I reread the books and I, I read his notes and he was, it was brilliant. He left full, full notes, you know, like he was writing a sentence to himself or to somebody. It was great. There was nothing shorthand in it, um, which made my life easier. But what I found is where I went in with this assumption that his work was this kind of scathing review of many of the systems that we've that we've created as a species um, and, it, and it was that you know certainly it, it, it you know it, it highlighted a lot of the issues of the world as we as we know it now um, but really when I boiled it down I, I found just optimism um, it was as Noah quoted it was this love letter to human potential it, I think at the core of all of his work is this belief that we as a species are capable of achieving incredible things and if you look at what we've achieved already you know, as, as is in the book, you know, we can, we soar to tremendous highs as a species, but we also sink to spectacular lows in the process. And I think a lot of the systems that we've created lead us more towards that side of it. And at the very root of dad's work was this belief of if we can create the conditions for every person to thrive, just imagine what it is that we might be able to create. Um, so, the, so the core value is, is that it, it was a belief in us as a species, and that comes down as well to another core belief, which is that we all have these incredible powers of creativity and imagination, that as a species, that's what separates us out from the rest of life on Earth. Um, where other species exist in the world as they find it, we create the worlds in which we live, and we do that through our powers of imagination, um, and then we, you know, we, we turn them into being through our powers of creativity. So this belief that we all have tremendous capacities. Um, so that, so that the, the human potential, our belief in our capacities of imagination and creativity, and also that each and every person on earth has what he called an element, which is the point where personal passion meets natural aptitude. It's where you find the thing that not only do you really love, but that you're good at. And it doesn't have to be a career. It can be a career. Um, Dad always made the point that the difference between being an amateur and a professional is simply whether or not someone's paying you. It's not the quality of the work or of what you're doing. But he believed that it was essential that we all find what it is that that is that for us, not just because it's a nice thing for us each to have and it makes our lives more fulfilling, which it does, um, but actually that that the that human ecosystems, our cultures are incredibly rich and complicated. Um, they're what he called complex adaptive systems, and that they depend upon the way nature depends upon you know, diversity of life to make ecosystems flourish. Our cultural societies depend upon this diversity and richness of talents to 
for them to flourish and to thrive. So that's that's the, the main reason why he felt that an element was so important that we each commit to finding what it is. And also he said, you know, he quoted the Dalai Lama, which is to be born at all is to be a miracle. You know, to be born at all is a miracle. Um, you know, you have one life, what are you gonna do with it? Um, but it, but it, it, as, much as, it, as much as it was a criticism of, of various systems, it really was optimism and belief in just in what we are capable of. That's fantastic, thank you. I love that uh, that you refer to this book as a love a love letter to humanity. Um, that's what it felt like to me as I was reading it. Um, uh, but this is not your usual collaborative book project by any means. Can you share with us a little bit about your process and how it all unfolded, and you know the the the, the unusual circumstances around it? So we, um, Dad had been working on the manifesto for a number of years, and it was almost a, a running joke in the family that if he, you know, if he said that he couldn't meet you or do something with you because he was working on the manifesto, he was blowing you off. Um, because try as he might, he'd really struggled to get, you know, some traction with his writing process himself. And I think a big part of it was how do you, the original, um, the original commission from Penguin was for 10,000 words. How do you boil this all down? And I didn't, I did it and we did it in the end, it's 25,000 words. Um, choosing what to keep in and what not to keep in was massive even for him. Um, so I, I was really excited knowing that he was working on it when in the summer of 2020, before he found out that he was dying, that he asked me to work on it with him. Um, and then when we found out that he was dying and, and we had, um, in the end, we had 18 days together from finding that out to when he passed away, he asked me to finish it for him. And we spent a lot of that, I'd say the the first week of his prognosis sitting together with him talking about really what it was that he wanted to leave behind what what was the core message of the manifesto what was what was it he wanted people to know after he was gone um so we did that together and then when he passed away it, it obviously took me a little while before I could think about it and look at it um but he left me you know just stacks of notes you know like like this one but you know hundreds of pages of it and copies and all the other books and all the videos and um I spent a good amount of time just sitting sifting through it all and getting and it was incredible you know because if anybody who suffered a loss like this it's awful but to have an opportunity to spend some time getting him into my head and trying to get into his head was a gift you know and I knew when we found out that he was dying and we were working it together that it would be a mix of you know, huge comfort in, in getting his words into my head and also absolute agony, you know, not being able to ask him a question or, you know, do you mind if I take this out or what if I tweak this a little bit? And, um, I went for long walks with lucky enough to live in the, in the countryside and I went for long walks around and I kind of expected him to appear at various points, like Mufasa in the clouds and the Lion King and just <laughs> kind of reach down and give me the answer. Um, so it was, and then, you know, what it boiled down to in the end was that, he asked me to do it he trusted me that I could do it and that's when um a friend of his lost her father a few years ago and she got in touch with me after dad passed away and forwarded the email that he sent her when she lost her father which was just incredible because it was almost like he she was sharing with me his advice for how to get over this but well, not over it through it um and he wrote something like I trust that the years of his love will be enough to sustain you through this difficult period um and in this case, that that's really what it boiled down to is, like, you know, a trust not only that he trusted me, but also a trust that he had, we'd, he'd left enough behind to do it justice. I hope I've done it justice. Um, so yeah, not not your usual, not your usual process, but it really felt like we were together writing it. And you know, there was a whole other thing then when I turned the book in and didn't have that voice anymore. So it's amazing to have it here, physical copies and people reading it. Well, I I I can be rest assured. His trust was well founded, and uh, you definitely did it justice. Um, in fact, I found myself as I was reading through trying to discern which parts were Ken and which parts were you, and I found myself uh, it, it was it was very difficult to to right. to, <laughs> to figure it out. Can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about? 
where those lines of demarcation started and ended. <laughs> I'm not sure I even know anymore. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's 100% his ideas. Um, and a lot of them, a lot of my words and, and all his ideas. Um, although there, there are little bits in it, we talk about rewilding education, which came from something he wrote in creative schools about organic systems of education. Um, and I think that's the mm -hmm. biggest thing I changed was turning it into organic or regenerative um, farming rather than organic, because it felt when he wrote creative schools in, I want to say 2000 and we'll say 15 ish, um, organic was kind of, it, it was the right term at the time, but it felt, you know, when I was writing it in 2021, that we, the, the field has moved forward and then no doubt it'll change again. And at some point I'll have to think of a different one, <laughs> but I'm glad you couldn't tell the difference. That's good. <laughs> um, uh, in the book, you talk about the creative revolution. Yeah. And, uh, you know, can you highlight some of the takeaways or calls to action that you both envision when you write about the creative revolution? Yeah, the first thing to say is that I, you know, when we found out he was dying, I promised him that I would continue his work and, and you know, and, and focus on his legacy. and. Um, I was acutely aware at the time, and I still am even more so now, that if I do nothing, you know, if I, if I go do something else, his legacy will continue. It continues in the day, the day life into the, in the work of hundreds, thousands, if not millions of people around the world who are inspired by him and who have committed to making the changes that he talks about. And he talked about, you know, if you're an educator or if you're within the system or if you're a creative practitioner, you are the system. You know, the system is made up of people. So if you change what you're doing, you're changing the system. Um, and that's where the revolution is. That's where the movement it is. It is in the day-to-day -day lives of people who are committing to doing things differently, to recognizing the potential in all of us. So, so that's the creative revolution and it's, it's happening, which is amazing. Um, and it's only growing within the book. It, it, there's a chapter at the end called be the change, uh, where we have takeaways, depending on where you are within the education system. And I make the point in the book that, you know, if you're a stakeholder in education, actually everybody is a stakeholder in education because whether you know whether you think you are or not, you you're affected by the the product the products of ed the education system. You know, somebody said to me the other day that um, a man called Paul Lindley said society is what happens when children grow up, and it's absolutely right. So whether you're a business owner or you know in higher education or wherever you are, you're affected by what comes out the other end of school. Um, so within that, there's there's call to actions for policymakers and for educators, for parents, for young people in particular, because I feel, you know, the system is designed, well, should, the, the system is for them. Without them, there is no, there's no point to the system. It's, it's empty halls. Um, but that's the one voice that needs rallying, I think. And it's not because they're not, they don't want to, it's because we do such a good job of, of telling children and young people that their voice doesn't matter until they hit a certain age. Um, so the vote, so the book speaks to them as well um, at the end. And um, and then if you're, you know, if you're a business or if you're just somebody walking down the street, this affects you. This idea of creating a future for us all, you know, is, is a deliberate title. It affects everybody. Um, yeah, so there, there are key takeaways within it for, for wherever you are within the revolution and the movement. Awesome. You know, when, when you and I were talking and preparing for this, you were talking about the concept of having to look back, to look forward. Um, and uh, I, I, I thought that was especially interesting given this unique process and given that the look forward is, 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 is you resting on the shoulders of this work, but can you talk about a little bit about how, what that means to you specifically? Yeah, um, you know, he wasn't done is what we mean by looking forward. You know, the, the idea with everything that we're doing with this in particular is it's not, the idea isn't to say that that was Sir Ken Robinson, let's remember him. Um, it's to take the work where he was going to take it. You know, him and my mum had just moved back to the UK um, to start a whole new chapter and a whole new adventure together and a whole new, um, you know, the next phase of this work. And so in order to continue it, that's what we have to do. We have to take it down the path where he was going to take it and then you know be adaptive to where it needs to go as well and um, but in order to do that we have to look back at what's already been done and a big part of that you know to go back to the creative revolution is to connect with the people who are already out there you know and and find out what's going on you know they're, they're the shining example of this is blue school and everything that you guys are doing there and just 
you know, you know, because you've been doing Blue School for how many years? Um, 12? How many years has Blue School been going? More than uh, we, we, I guess we've started uh, more than 15 years ago. We have four graduating class of eight graders and the, the, literally the first class is now being admitted into college so it's it's freaking my head out yeah I bet it is. <laughs> but you know then you know you know it works because you implement so many of these principles um into the daily life at blue school so and and you know that it works so it's looking back is looking at the work that he did it's looking at his notes and his books and um but it's also looking at you know lay of the land of where we are now and then what, how, how do we all collectively take it forward you know what what um we make the case in the book that we're at a critical pass in our evolution as a species. We can't carry on down the path that we're going down. You just have to look at the events that are happening at the moment in the world. Um, you know, the answer isn't to continue doing what we've done more of. We have to change our path. We have to correct our course and, and work for a better future, for a better, you know, we have, we have to make sure that we have a planet to do it on and we have to make sure that we have healthy, engaged, confident, fulfilled people on it. Yeah, and I mean, I can tell you that that my for myself and the other co-founders of Blue School, that that course correction, our our whole intent was to grab kids as young as possible, you know, two years old, and you know the old thing of a two percent, you know, change in navigation puts you on opposite yeah. ends of the universe eventually. Um, I know that you know, of course, can felt like having a creative re revolution in schools was critical. Um, he's, that's been well documented. Um, uh, but he also felt like that creative revolution needed to take place in every nook and cranny of humanity. Um, can you sort of give us a, a, a sense of your thinking, his thinking of, you know, beyond schools and, yeah. uh, yeah, the, that, that talks about three myths around creativity, which I think are important to highlight. The first is that, you you know, creativity is about special people. Um, so you have your you know, creative people and you're not creative people, that it's about um, certain subjects, special subjects, particularly the arts. They're, they're the creative subjects and all the other ones, the academic subjects. And the third myth is that you're either creative or you're not, and there's nothing that you can do about it. And the truth is that... Um, we all have immense powers of creativity. You know, it isn't just for certain special people. It's absolutely everybody has these powers of creativity. And I think a big misunderstanding comes from the second myth, which is that only certain things are creative pursuits, when in reality, absolutely everything we do as human beings involves some form of creative thinking. We write in the book that intelligence and creativity are blood relatives. You, you can't have one without the other. It's a facet of our intelligence as a species. Um, right. And the third is that, you know, you're either creative or you're not. And we know that's just not true anymore we know that the brain is plastic that it the, and creativity is like any muscle within you know the body the more you use it the stronger it becomes the more the more you're able to use it so I mentioned that only because I think it's very important in education but these myths hold true way beyond education we do it in our businesses we have the creatives and we have the suits we have you know the the creative activities and the not creative activities and and so often we have people who just think they're not creative when in fact they are, they just haven't tapped into their potential yet, or they don't realize that they're doing it, I think is another big one. You know, they don't, they, they disregard certain things they do as being, you know, oh, well, that's not creativity because it doesn't involve painting or something. Um, right, or it, it's the actual definition of creativity is, 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 is too limited. Yeah. And that, you know, that there are plenty of people and professions that you wouldn't necessarily attribute creativity or an innovation to, you, you know, from, from law to plumbing, like they're, yeah. they're, that, that, they're, that, that bringing one's creativity and innovation and, and new lens on in, in almost any area is an act of creativity. Exactly. Yeah, it's uh, the definition that we use in the book came from a report that dad did it led in the 90s for the group of people uh, called All Our Futures in 1999. And the definition they came up with was it's the process of having original ideas that have value. Um, and the process is what people, misunderstand often they you know they think that well they had an idea it didn't work so you know I'm not creative I'm not good at this but it's this constant dialogue between coming up with ideas evaluating the ideas trying them again scrapping them 
um, and ideas in this phase are really vulnerable. It's, it's, you know, you can squash an idea. You can it, you make it very easy for people to just think, oh, it's not worth the time or, you know, it's a dead end. Um, but you just push through it and you're right. We do that in every, you know, almost in a, if definitely on a daily basis. You know, we do it in conversations. We change the way, you know, we change our tact. We do it even when we're driving to school to make, you know, to get there a little bit quicker. Um, it, it, it's a function of how our intelligence works. So, and I mentioned it because it's, it's so important in the rest of our life. You know, the times, the time when people had one job and they stuck to it for the rest of their life is, is for almost everybody it's gone, certainly in the West. People will have lots of different jobs over the course of their career. They'll try on different things. They'll have to learn very quickly. And creativity gives us the ability to be adaptive, you know, and as, and as the world continues to, to evolve and to change, um, we have to be just look at what we've done in the past two years, you know, as a species, as a whole world, we've had to be adaptive. We've had to, you know, I should be in New York with you right now. You know, we should be there together doing this like you were with dad. And we're, we're so comfortable doing this over zoom now because we couldn't have done this two and a half years ago, you know? Right. And I always butch this quote and I really should write it down one day, but dad wrote that in out of our minds, he wrote the more complex the challenges the world become, the more creative we have to be to meet them. And it's absolutely true. And they're, you know, they're, they're pretty complex at the moment. So the case we make in the book is that we have to channel our creative capacity into a more determined vision of the future that we want to create, because along with all the wonderful things it helps us do, it's also brought a lot of well, all of the discord into the world. It's also, you know, it is because of imagination, we're able to do this and we're able to have conversations and create works of art and we're able to have systems of democracy. But we've also got, you know, war um, and inequalities and, you know, biases that shouldn't exist. So it's about it's about it's about channeling and honing the creative skills into the vision that we want to create and that's a big conversation that's great um changing gears just a tiny little bit you know uh i had the great honor and pleasure on several different occasions to uh either be on the same program with ken or speak in the same events or or even just you know be there with him like when we did the uh when he spoke at the UN and I was just uh uh you know audience member and the thing that was so extraordinary was uh people felt so heard and seen by him by his work and his message he had a rock star status it, it it was literally, and I and I think back to the UN uh, example specifically. We had to get somewhere else. I know you've experienced this many times. There was a schedule. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we couldn't get out of the lobby. There were people online waiting to speak <laughs> with him to connect, and every single person and and he, you know, he could, would never listen to anyone. Be, yeah. Was trying to whisk him <laughs> off to. A car, or you know, for the next. I'm glad that wasn't just me, <laughs> right? And he was that. connected with the person yeah. that he was meeting for the very first time, that wanted to talk about his message and his work. And I, I, I know you have way more experience uh, with that phenomenon. Do, 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 what was that exactly? How do you? <laughs> it was incredible. But, you know, the reason he was so hard to get out of those situations is he was so curious about people, you know, and he I, I, he had this ability to make you feel like the most special person in the room because, you know, he had this knack of seeing or, or not even a knack of seeing what was special, but of taking the time to figure out what was special about somebody. You know, he never looked over someone's shoulder. He took the time to have a conversation with somebody when they were there and he would remember it for ages. I, I mean, a brilliant example is the day that he had his surgery um, in in. 2020 it was a huge nine hour surgery um and i spoke to him from the the intensity unit the the what's it called the high intensity unit after a surgery the icu um you know you just come around and he literally spent the whole time telling me about the lives of the anesthetist and what their kids are doing <laughs> you know and the nurse does this but she wants to do that and she's going to do that later and i was like i mean after nine hours of general anesthesia <laughs> you and you took you know you're about to go into the knife and you're still you're asking the people around them what it, what they do. You know, he was so authentic, which is, I think that stands out. He wasn't, I mean, you know, because you shared the stage with him, you watched him and you knew him. 
the guy on stage was the guy at the table. You know, he was, there wasn't an alter ego. There was no, we used to joke, you know, he'd put in a suit and be Sir Ken Robinson, but there was no distinction. He was the same no matter who you are. And that was really special. And I think also the reason it resonated with so many people that kind of elevated into this rock star status was that um, he, he was funny and engaging and you didn't feel like you were being preached at. You know, it was this human connection that he had of just going out and speaking to people and um, that you, you'd walk away realizing that you'd learned something, but you weren't sat there thinking that you were being taught to, which is just amazing. And then what, you know, what he said, hit a nerve. We did a campaign, uh, my husband, Anthony and I, the co-founder of Imagine If the Festival, we did a campaign years ago when we first started working with dad called 10 Years On, um, which was 10 years after the, that first TED talk, we asked people to send in what the talk had meant to them over the 10 years. We had thousands of responses. One stuck out for me. Somebody said, I felt heard even though I hadn't spoken. And that that's, you know, he gave voice to millions of people who thought, is it me? Am I what's wrong? And to hear from somebody that, no, it's not you, it's the system, you know, or, and there are millions of people, more people than not, who are, who are badly affected by it, um, was a gift. It was a gift to so many people to just, just to be told that they weren't crazy. It wasn't them that was at fault. Right. And Kate, I mean, as we, as I mentioned at the top, we, uh, I've known you since you were a teenager. Um, you eventually uh, became an intern and student teacher at Lou School. Yeah. Um, spent some really lovely quality time in New York City. Um, but I know that you didn't start out like, I'm just gonna dive into my dad's work and you know document it and forward it and, and that's gonna be my life's calling. Can, Tell us a little bit about that journey. What, where, how did that all evolve for you? Well, I, so I left school at 16, which, you know, in America, it's in England, you can leave school at 16 in America. It's more frowned upon. Um, and I left school at 16 because I was one of the people who resonated with the message. You know, I didn't, I didn't fit into the, the traditional system. Um, as it was, I didn't get the grades I was supposed to, and I didn't, I didn't fit into the system. Um, and having the parents that I have, um, you know, they could see I was deeply unhappy and we sat down and they said, you know, if you were, what do you want to do? So we looked at other schools. Um, if I hadn't been too old for blue school, I would have gone there. And, um, so we looked, we looked at other schools and none of them were right. Or the one that I wanted didn't have a place for me. And yada, yada. so they said, you know, you could, if you, if we were in England, you could leave school. Um, so what do you, you know, and it's not your fault. We're not in England anymore. So what would you like to do? So I said, I want to leave. Um, and we did, I think we'd, we'd call it unschooling now. So we had a list of things I could do and a list of things I couldn't do. I couldn't run away with the circus. I couldn't have a baby where, you know, I had to, I couldn't spend all day in bed. I had to, I had to do something. Um, but within that, we made a list of things I wanted to do. So I volunteered and I did courses at UCLA Extension and um, I worked, I had a brief stint working for Miley Cyrus. Um, you know, that I, I should caveat all this with saying I'm acutely aware of how privileged that story is that not only was I lucky enough to have parents who could support me in leaving school financially but also who could support me in the vision of it um, and open doors to go so I'm I'm not saying it would be this easy for everybody but for me I had the opportunity and it was it's when my life began um I've always loved kids I've always loved working with kids I love you guys so when you say come to blue school there was no stopping me getting on the plane <laughs> I'm like all right let's do this <laughs> Um, and I had, you know, I had the joy of working in the twos class. You mentioned that you guys start early. It was just incredible. Yeah. I, I, in fact, a lot of the things I learned at Blue School, I do with my daughter now, who's three. Uh, she'd, she'd love it. If we were in New York, she'd be there in a heartbeat. She, we have a great school here as well, but she would be in, she'd be at Blue School if we were in New York. Um, so that, so, so first of all, the message resonated with me. Um, and then the second is that, you know, dad, dad was my hero. He was magnetic even to me. So just the chance to be around him more. And to, to watch him to, you know, the pleasure of being in the audience or just talking to him about these things was exciting, you know, and it, it gave us a chance to work together. Um, and the more we did, the more passionate I became about it. And I had a chance to work for 100, which is a Finnish initiative that looks at the, the innovations that are already changing education on a daily basis. So if you don't know it, it's amazing. They publish a, a list every year of, of people, you know, who are really, really being the change. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, I thought I, I, I thought we'd have more time to do it together. Me and dad, I, um, 
you know, I, I got a lot more autonomy a lot quicker than I was expecting. <laughs> um, but, you know, like I said earlier, I think, you know, he, he left enough of him behind to steer us in the right direction, I think. Well, in reading the book, I can assure you that his his work, his legacy, his message is is in great hands. You did a f- fantastic job. Thank you. Um, it, for the people on this Zoom, you've got to get the book. It's it's really uh, inspirational and and beautiful and clear and uh, and and I just loved every minute that I spent with it. Um, we are gonna open it up to some of the questions for the people in the audience. Um, before we do, though, uh, we did give a little uh, the what if provocation to blue school students. And um, we just have, it's under two minutes, but we just wanted to share with you and the audience what, what the blue school what if. Amazing. Imagine if learning about climate change was part of every student's education. Imagine if we could stop burning fossil fuels and live in a clean atmosphere. Imagine if women and children were given the same education and health opportunities as men. Imagine if kids could vote, allowing them to have a voice about their own futures, changing education, forcing lawmakers to protect the environment, and ensuring that equity, equality, and social justice are at the heart of every government decision. Imagine if we left the ocean for fish, rather than using it as our own trash can. Imagine if politicians realize we have to put our planet first. Imagine if we realize climate change is our greatest threat. Imagine if communities impacted by climate change had the power of politicians. Imagine if companies were held responsible for their actions. The ocean, which is currently filled with billions of tons of plastic, would be cleaned up by the companies that made said plastic. An increased use in electric-powered vehicles would cause a rush of innovation that would speed up discoveries in clean energy use. Imagine if we weren't running out of time. <laughs> I, I love that, that little video clip. Noah, we're going to turn it over to you for some, I see we got dozens and dozens, literally dozens and dozens and dozens of questions. Um, I'm sure you could distill a lot of them down to a, a, a few and then maybe there's some outliers. I do wanna just ad lib here for one second. And I don't think that we got a, a Chiron, a, a label at the bottom of that first performance. Um, uh, Kate. Ch- Chizara Agor, she's a brilliant, um, a brilliant performer from the Roundhouse Young Creative Program. Her name is Chizara Agor. And uh, the, that. I was going to say that too. <laughs> that's fantastic. And and the Roundhouse, by the way, uh, is this incredible, uh, legendary theater in in London, where everyone, every single amazing rock band from the Stones on down, all played. Um, uh, but it it was also a place that Ken had a uh, was a, a, a an advisor and creative director, and 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 he and I actually did uh, our last the la- this last you know, event this last live event last live event together and it, it was a, a wonderful beautiful uh, Chizara performed at that event as well which is why it was very special to have that piece here tonight yeah I was so glad to see that Noah you no, had a lot of- we, there were there were there were a lot of questions and also just dozens of comments and Kate particularly wanted to make sure that you knew um, and you'll have a chance to see them after just dozens of comments about um, offering so much affection uh, for your dad and personal connections that individuals had with him and with his work and appreciation for you and your own reflections about your relationship with him and your work with him. Um, and so there are also questions about, you know, could all this work be translated into different languages to bring across the world? Would this discussion be available after for people who missed it? Um, would there be opportunities for you to go and bring this book and visit other countries across the world? There are lots of invitations embedded in there. And just, to, um, and also just 
yeah, there was a lot of there was a lot of love um, in the questions. Um, I, I can speak to the international languages. We are in the process at the minute of having it sold into international markets. So it's, it should be out in Bulgarian and Italian. Um, it's coming out in Taiwan if it's not out already and Spain at the moment. That's all we have. But we're working on selling it to as many places as possible to get it translated. Wonder. So I'm going to try to squeeze in two questions if we can with time. The first was really just a question about a memory of, uh, of your dad to share. There was a, because of the personal pieces out if there was a childhood memory that um, you could share with folks for a moment before jumping into a question about your work. Very nice question. Um, I don't know if I could pick just one, but I'll try that. I think the most remarkable thing about him as a father was what I said to Matt before about how he gave you his attention. Um, you know, and that was true to even us as kids that he would give, you know, if he was with you, he was present and with you, um, which was amazing. My favorite memories were us just sitting around talking, you know, we weren't, um, children this happened, but my best friend in the whole world, Julie has flown over from LA to be here today for the book launch. And we were just reminiscing that when my parents shut up, you know, sold the house in LA before they moved here in 2020, we sat around counting the loose change which should be a really boring <laughs> mundane job for anybody to do. But with that, it was just, you know, we were all falling off our chairs as we were doing it. He made the the day-to-day -day just seem incredible. Um, but I think you, I, I, one very nice memory, and I can actually, maybe I'll put some photos on social media after this to show you. Um, we went to Donegal a lot as a child because my mom is Irish and her family's all over in Ireland. So we went to Donegal. And there was one day dad spent the entire day making... Um, sand sculptures like this massive mermaid um, a massive boat that we could sit in and pretend to drive I don't know how long it must have taken him but we were there for hours and um Matt you can maybe vouch this because you knew him but I know my mom certainly can when he started something you know it had to be perfect <laughs> you know there was no corners cut it was um which made him a nightmare around the house for the work to do but but pretty incredible yeah I don't know if I could pick one that just it's thank you Kate um and, and about the book, um, is, there, is there one thing we might be able to ask of ourselves uh, to realize your dad's manifesto and this manifesto in Imagine If? Another brilliant question. Um, I think the biggest thing that you can do as an individual, regardless of who you are or where you are, is to acknowledge that you, you are a part of something that is bigger than you are. Um, dad wrote a contribution to an incredible book called the uh, genius 100 visions of the future to celebrate Einstein's 100th anniversary of um, the theory of relativity and he wrote at the end and it's actually it's, it's the last manifesto statement in the book um, he wrote there's more to life on earth than human beings and more to being human than self-interest our, our future depends on learning this lesson by heart and I think you know he was a huge believer in holism that the the individual, you know, is a, is a vital part to the whole functioning and also, you know, the individual functions because it is a part of the whole, the, the interconnectedness of, its, of us all. Um, so I think if there is one thing that you can do as an individual, regardless of who you are, or where you are, or what you're doing, it's just take stock of the fact that you are a part of this and to recognize that life is short. Um, we have one planet, we have one life, one shot, and, and to make the most of it. That's awesome. I think uh, also uh, in answer to the very earlier question, Noah, yes, this will be made available um, uh, on your website on uh, Imagine If or, or, or Never Gray. You, you, you can help us with that. Uh, we're doing another one of these um, at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, and uh, so if you want to, uh, you know, email all your friends and have them join us on that one. Or if you want to join us again, we'll try to change it up a little bit. Uh, and then we'll edit together. We'll edit me out completely and we'll edit all the best parts about Kate's answers and, and, and we'll get some, and Kate will We're get it out. out. We're keeping you in. So yes, it will be available. The one other thing, I imagine Kate might want to remind us of before we close is that this is just the beginning of the Imagine a Festival. Really? And so I, I just, it's important to say, and so I want to, but I'll, I'll, I'll pass that to you and then I will fade into the. Um, 
Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, that is true. So Imagine If is a festival, a wider festival that last year was designed to be a week-long celebration of the life and legacy of dad of Sir Ken Robinson. Um, and then the idea is always that it would be an annual event, an annual celebration of human potential of our diversity of talents and interests. And today is day one and it, it's continuing for the entire month of March. So I'd encourage you to go to imagine-if.com and, and get involved. And also if you'd like to do something, um, host your own event or get your own work out there, then there's a little link where you can tell us about that too, because it's, it, is, it is about all of us together. That is so exciting. Um, so we're going to close, but we're going to do one quick, just fun little thing. Um, we're going to open up the chat, which has not been open until right now. So um, it's opening up this moment. And um, we're going to ask people to finish the, the phrase, imagine if it's your own personal provocation of imagine if. And if you don't mind, also tell us where you're from, because that's just fun, because I know that there are people uh, from countries all over the world. Um, so do that right now. Imagine if, put it into your chat. We're going to give you about five more seconds. I can't believe it. We're literally to the moment that we said we were going to do it. Oh, three to four. We're right what at four. Point. <laughs> Imagine if. Counting down five. Look at it go, the numbers. <laughs> Look at all wow. of these. This is Great. amazing. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is Hello, so everyone. I've never seen done this before. I'm so I don't uh, know if everyone can see how many messages there are all of a sudden, but it's gone from none to well over a hundred in like three oh, seconds. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Hi. Oh. Aww. <laughs> uh, Kate, thank you. That's amazing. Thank you for us, uh, you know, first of all, spending this hour with us. Thank you for doing this work, um, for putting yourself out there. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, talk about art therapy, literature therapy, um, uh, and, uh, and, and also we're gonna, I'm going to thank Ken for his lifetime of work um, that I'm, I'm just, we're all, I can speak collectively for everyone on this call and way beyond on the Zoom. Uh, we, we're appreciative to you for continuing that work. Um, it's Imagine If, creating a future for us all. It's available right this second. Buy this book, don't, don't <laughs> mess up. It would be a huge mistake for you not to buy it and, and get it for anyone you care about. Huge mistake. Uh, thank you to all the Zoom participants. Uh, thank you, Noah. Thank you, Blue School. It's, it seems like a simple thing to put an hour together like this, and it's really uh, not so simple. And a lot of people just giving themselves. So thank you, everyone. We're so appreciative. Kate and I are going to sign off. We'll leave it, uh, the, 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 the Zoom open for just a little while longer because we're getting over 400 participants it's still Incredible. going full speed. So we don't want to. We don't want to cut anyone off who wants to uh, add to the uh, chat. So, Kate, Thank sending you so much, Matt. just pure love Thank to you. you and your family. Thank you. This has been, and thank you to everybody who's come, and, and a huge thank you to Blue School as well. It's a very special occasion. Terrific. All right, signing off. <laughs>